Welcome to Staples. Hi, Staples guy. I have to get my kids ready for back to school. Staples has tons of deals, like one subject notebooks for just 25 cents. So they'll be 110% ready. Wait a minute. That's 10% more ready than 100% ready. That's right. Yeah, I was a math major. I could tell. Make low prices happen. Make 110% ready happen. Staples, make more happen. Right now, Staples 16 gigabyte flash drives are just $5.99. Offer valid while supplies last. Limit five per customer ends 8 15 15. Blog Talk Radio. We are the UR Tennis Network. Our mission is to be the voice of tennis. We enlist a team of passionate enthusiasts to promote our sport. We strive to bring interesting perspectives on the many spins of tennis. Our goal is to provide the learners of our sport with current news and information from many angles. We seek active participation from communities interested in tennis, but tennis is not interested in them. We are expanding our outreach. Tennis is a true lifetime sport that needs to be talked about, and the UR Tennis Network pledges to pursue this idea relentlessly. Good morning and welcome to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and today is our college recruiting mulligan show <laughs> since I had problems with the last one uploading the podcast. Um, I just decided we would just redo it and that way it can be recorded for posterity for those of you who can't stay on with us uh, the full time today or maybe didn't get a chance to tune in live to the show At least now you'll have a reference to go back to. And gratefully, I am joined today by Chaz Bradley of Scholarship for Athletes. And for those of you who are used to hearing from Ross Greenstein at SFA, Ross has moved on. Uh, He has sold the company. And Chaz is the new director of tennis for SFA. So I thought she would be a great resource to have on the air with us today to answer the questions that I can't answer or maybe give a broader perspective than just my family's personal experience as we went through the process. But before I bring Chaz on air with us, I'm going to go to a quick PSA, and when we come back, we are going to be talking college recruiting. Warning. Orthopedic surgeons are seeing an increase in overuse injuries when young athletes perform the same repetitive, repetitive stressful motions over and over. over. <laughs> Pitching, tennis, weight training, even long swimming workouts can cause overuse trauma that may require surgery. If your kids play and train hard, visit orthoinfo.org or stopsportsinjuries.org. A message from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. Welcome back to the Parenting Aces Radio Show. I'm your host, Lisa Stone. If you would like to call in and chat with us today or ask any questions, that number is 714-583-6853. Again, 714-583-6853. Five three. So let me bring Chaz on the line, and we are going to jump right into talking about the specifics of college recruiting. Chaz, thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm happy to be here, Lisa. Why don't you give our listeners a little bit of background on your uh, life in tennis? I know you were a collegiate tennis player as well, and uh, maybe share what your role specifically is going to be with Scholarship for Athletes. Sure, sure. Um, I've been around tennis my whole life. I started playing when I was about seven or eight years old, and a competitive junior out of Kentucky I was always ranked kind of, you know, one and two in the state and and top 15 in the south and around 70 or 80 in the nation. So, um, you know, I was recruited pretty heavily as a junior tennis player. Um, And I um, took a lot of time in the recruiting process. I made sure that I took my five official visits with the NCAA. And um, I ended up at North Carolina State University, which I absolutely loved. It was a, a great experience and the right choice for me. Um, and then after college, um, I took some time away from tennis and then eventually came back to it, got into teaching, um, 
at a local club in Jacksonville, Florida, and then um, went over into the coaching side. And so I was the women's head tennis coach at the University of North Florida. And then I took over at Stetson University and was the associate head for the men and the women. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I really enjoyed uh, being able to coach the the men's side as well. So that was a great experience for me. And so when I was approached um, um, about three months ago um, to come on to scholarship for athletes, it seemed like a really good fit for me. Um, I feel like it's a, a really good consulting company and, um, you know, we can walk the, the clients through the recruiting process. And for me, I feel like, you know, I have a lot of knowledge just because not only was I heavily recruited and went through the process, but I also have been a coach and so I really know what what coaches are looking for. So you have just a great perspective to offer for our listeners today, and I'm, again, so grateful to you for taking time out to be with us. I'm going to start with one of the questions that I got, which was, when to when do you use a recruiting service? And I want to just say, before I turn it over to you, Chaz, that, you know, one of the reasons that our family chose to use a service was because my son really had cast a wide net with schools. He wasn't just focusing his efforts on uh, schools in our area or our region of the country in the southeast and eventually became solely focused on California schools, which are you know clear across the country for us. And since we didn't have the ability to just keep flying out to the West Coast for him to play tournaments out there and get seen, we felt like it was really important to have the help of Ross at the time and Scholarship for Athletes, Um, but, you know, just a recruiting service in general that could help make those connections for us. And and I want to say that, you know, in addition to making the introductions and helping my son to refine his list of schools and all of those kind of obvious things that you guys did for us. From my perspective, the biggest plus of working with SFA was y'all got to be the bad guys. I got to step Mm -hmm. out of the picture, and y'all were the ones that were sending the email reminders, sending the text messages, calling my son and saying, have you done this? Did you follow up here? What about this right. idea? You know, how are your grades? Um, right. how, what's what's your practice schedule looking like? You need to work harder. You know, <laughs> those kinds right. of things. Right. And it took me out of the picture. So can you talk a little bit about what the different levels of service that y'all offer and sure. how somebody might make the decision to engage a recruiting service. Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things I just want to touch on quickly is what you said about how we can kind of be the, the bad guys. Um, so really what we focus on at SFA is um, really helping the client. And the client is the PSA, the prospective student athlete, because um, our goal is to really um, teach the PSA how to network and how to build relationships and, um, you know, really um, the coaches are wanting to build that relationship with the prospective student athlete, not with the parent. So the emails and um, all communication should come from the student athlete and not the parents. So that is why we really focus on um, you know, talking to the player, um, you know, we will send out weekly texts and, you know, daily texts and, and emails and and really, really help the, the client it, and show them that it's important that they reach out to the coaches and they are the one networking because they're the one that's trying to build the relationship. They're the one that's going to be playing for the coach. So, um, so that's one of our, our main our main goals and our tools that we use. As far as when to kind of start using um, a recruiting service, I would say, um, you know, by your sophomore or your junior year, 
Um, a lot of kids are committing earlier. You don't see it as much in tennis as you do in, in some of the other sports. Um, definitely, my husband is the head coach at Purdue for the golf team. And so he has recruits that are committing their freshman and sophomore year. Um, it's very common in golf. But in can tennis, I, a lot of times. Can, sure, go ahead. I was going to say, can I interrupt you one second? Because that's another sure. big question that keeps coming up is this whole idea of early commitments. And I want to just be really clear with listeners that any commitment that's made before November of senior year is non-binding, really. It's, it's verbal. And um, yeah. so there, there's a lot of concern that, that I'm hearing on the part of parents that, oh, my gosh, you know, all these kids in my, my child's recruiting class have committed already and they're just right. entering their, the beginning of their junior year. Those are non-binding agreements between the coach and the player, and there are countless situations where the player changes his or her mind and the coach changes his or her mind. So, I, I, you know, maybe you can speak to that. I don't want people to get so bogged down in this whole, you know, seemingly new trend of early commitment. Right. That's true. That's true. And, um, you know, the thing also with early commitment is you never know. There could always be a coaching change. Um, there is a lot of coaching changes in all sports. Um, so... Um, the main thing with the early commitments and, and why you are seeing it, I feel like, um, in the other sports is um, I feel that the, for instance, I'll always probably a lot of time refer back to golf since I'm, I'm very familiar with that with my husband's role. Um, you know, when the, when the kids commit earlier, um, you know, I feel like, they are taking some pressure off of them with this whole recruiting process. Um, you know, they they do go ahead and they do make some unofficial visits at an early age, and if they start to have build a really good relationship with that coach, um, then that's that's kind of the way they go about and, and make their early commitment. And everyone is different. I mean, it's all going to be, um, you know, really personal preference. Um, sometimes it works out for them, and sometimes it doesn't. Like you said, they, they may verbally commit, and then a year before they may change their mind. So um, as far as um, getting back to when to kind of start the process, I feel like, you know, by your sophomore year in high school, you should really be, you know, have your initial school list made and start to make some, some unofficial visits. Um, and the same goes for by, definitely by your junior year um, because come that, that senior year, you're not going to be able to visit all the schools that are, that are on your list. And, you know, this is probably the biggest decision that a PSA, a prospective student athlete, is going to make in their 18 years of their life. It's where they're going to be playing college tennis and where they're going to be spending the next four years. So to kind of wait and rush it by your senior year, um, you know, it um it will it will leave you with less options, I would say. Um And I as far I'll add to that too. Sorry, I don't mean to keep interrupting you, but no, no, I, I lose my train of thought if I don't throw it in there. <laughs> um I wanna just add to that that again, um my son did cast a very wide net. We did start working with scholarship for athletes uh, my son's sophomore year, and his initial list of schools, when he sent it to Ross, Ross emailed him back and said, nope, try again. The, you're not going to be playing right. in any of these schools. These are not appropriate for you to be reaching out to. And at that point, my son said to me, I'm not working with him. He doesn't believe in me. I'm going to play at one of these schools. And to his credit, he is ending up at not one of the schools on that initial list, but certainly a school of the same level as the schools on that initial list. And, and you know, he was one of those kids that was a late bloomer and needed right. kind of a kick in the pants to, to put the work in. But, you know, so 
I, I do think that there is a huge plus of starting this process early. And with all the tournaments our kids play, there's no reason that when you're playing a tournament and there are schools in that same vicinity, that you shouldn't just take a drive over and walk around the campus and stop by the tennis courts. And if the coach is around, shake his or her hand and introduce yourself and You know, just kind of start to get a feel for what these various schools look like, what the students look and feel like. And for the student, uh, the the PSA as you're calling them, um, to to kind of get a sense of where they feel could be home for them. And that differs for every single kid. And that can change, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I I completely agree with that. That is also something that we will, um, you know, we talk to the clients about. Um, you know, we look at their tournament schedules, and we can recommend certain schools in the area, and um, hopefully they may have a day before or a day after the tournament f- finishes, and they can go by and make an unofficial at those universities in the area, for sure. And there's no limit on the number of unofficial visits. So, you know, Absolutely there's no reason none. not to stop by and, and take a look. Is is there a minimum number of schools that you guys recommend people have on their list? Like I said, my son had a had a pretty extensive list when he started, but it, it got scaled back pretty quickly. Right, right. I would say, um, you know, it's very different for every for every client. Um, you know, some of the some of the PSAs that I speak to may only have ten on their list um, at the very beginning, and um, and some may have fifty. So it's very different for. And it also, um, you know, one of the things that when I first have my conversation um, with the client is. You know, I'll ask them about their uh, preference for, you know, a certain geographical part of the country. Um, And so sometimes that can either make your list larger or smaller. So um, I would say an initial list, um, you know, I would like to see, in my opinion, maybe 20, 20 schools on there, in my opinion. Okay. And then, and then, scale it back as as you start going Absolutely. on the unofficials and things like that. So, Absolutely. you know, another question that comes through is how do you figure out which schools to put on your list? Are there some websites? Are there criteria to use? And I, you know, one of the things that was helpful to us was using tennisrecruiting.net. Um, you can look on there. You can search by conference. Um, yes. You can, you know, get a lot of information on the school there and then, you know, click on the school's website and get even more information. Right. Um, for my son, I think identifying conferences was really helpful because what what tends to happen, at least what we saw uh, in tennis, is that a conference is made up of schools that are similar in size, um, similar in, you know, the academic rigor um, and all of these, you know, little kind of fine details. And so if you identify conferences that are of interest, then all of a sudden you've got 8 to 15 schools that you can investigate further. And so that was a really helpful thing for us. And then the other thing that was helpful was using Universal Tennis's website and um, going on and looking at the UTR, the ratings for the players on the existing team and comparing that, you know, with his UTR so he could see, oh, I have a shot of, playing at this level on this team, I'm going to be sitting on the bench if I go to this school, I'm going to be at the top of the lineup right. if I go to that school, and then making those kinds of choices, because some kids are okay going to a higher-ranked school and just being part of the team and never setting foot on the court, or only playing Absolutely. you know, when they play way lower-ranked teams. Other kids are not happy with that, and Absolutely. I think... You know, when I talk to parents, um, one of the things that I I try to point out is that, 
you have to make sure that your child is being honest about what they're looking for in a college tennis experience, not just what they're looking for in the college from an academic standpoint or a social standpoint, but what they're looking for from their tennis experience there as well. And then make your list based on those factors. Do you agree with agree. that? I completely agree with that. I agree with everything you said. Um, you know, I think that what we really uh, emphasize at FSA is that it's the PSA's responsibility really to do their homework. And and your homework is really finding out a, a lot of as much about the school as you possibly can. Um, you know, you mentioned Tennis Recruiting Network and, and Universal Tennis, and, and they definitely are, are good starts, and they can help you kind of um, learn about the different conferences. Um, a lot of times as coaches, um, you know, we'll refer, I say as coaches as I'm being a former coach, but um, a lot of times, um, you know, you'll hear us speak of the big conferences versus middle major conferences. And, um, you know, in big conferences, we're talking about the, you know, the, the ACC um, conference and the SEC conference and, um, you know, and then the middle major conferences are, are the smaller conferences. And, and most of the time, they have um, smaller budgets and, um, you know, smaller, smaller facilities. Um, just because they're that those schools are not bringing in as much money as the as the big as the big schools, uh, for instance, you know in the SEC, obviously Alabama is is bringing in a lot of money from their from their football program, so that's going to funnel over to all the other spin build their facilities. Um, so um, you know um, when you're getting back to the PSA doing their homework. Um, you know, you really want to find out as much as you can about those conferences. And, um, you know, our job is to help you um, analyze your ability and and really find the right fit and to find out where you, you can play. And you mentioned as well that some some prospective student athletes are happy with just being on that team. So, you know, they may not ever see the lineup at Georgia Tech or the University of Georgia or the University of Kentucky and the SEC, but just to be on that team and, and have that atmosphere um, and, and be a part of it and being just a walk-on, for instance, that they're fine with that, um, whereas some players are not. They want to go somewhere where they know that they're going to be able to, to compete and that their, their points matter. So it's really finding out, and and, ta- and you said it's important for, for the um, student athlete to be honest, and 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 that's for us to to talk with them and figure that out. So, um, but yeah, those are all very important, very important points for sure. And and not only does the student athlete need to be honest, the parents need to be honest as well about what their expectations are in terms of financial aid, in terms of scholarship money, in terms of, you know, how much time the the PSA is going to be putting in in the classroom and on the tennis court and off the court training. Um, and, you know, just be up front with your child about what you expect out of them because there are – minimum GPAs that the NCAA sets forth for kids to be to remain eligible to play athletics at the college level but that doesn't necessarily mean that's your family's minimum GPA cuz the NCAA standards relatively low and right. so i think it's it's important to you know if your child is saying they want to go to a top tier um, D1 school where they are going to be required to be in the gym and on the court and, you know, playing practice matches and doing community service with the team for, you know, X number of hours a week, how does that jibe with your, the parents' expectations for their academic performance? Absolutely, absolutely. And those are all questions that um, – you know that you need to that you need to address with your 
with your child before they start the process. And then once they start that process and they start building the relationships with the coaches, then, um, you know, those are, those are questions that, that will need to be asked, you know, exactly how many hours are, you know, are, you know, what is a typical day like for a student athlete? I mean, that's a very Mm -hmm. typical question. Um, and I mean, I can tell you, you know, just from, from playing D1 tennis, I mean, my typical day consisted of playing tennis and going to school and playing more tennis and eating really quickly and getting to study hall for a couple hours and going to bed. I mean, that was about (laughs) it. I mean, it is a full-time job. So, um, you know, and, and, and some people will be really happy with that and they will love it. And, and some kids will, will not love it. Um, you know, and, and so you will see some kids, um, you know, not, um, not return, um, you know, you'll see some transfer and, um, you know, so it's just, like you said, you need to know, um, going into this that, um, you know, D1 tennis at a high level, it is, um, you know, it's a job. It is not, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, I, I absolutely loved my experience, but, um, you know, but it, you know, some people are cut out for it and some people aren't, I'll just say that. (laughs) Well, and even if your child isn't playing in the lineup, they're still expected to put the work in with the team. So I want to be clear about that too. That's, that's another question that keeps coming up. You know, how are, how are the kids that aren't in the lineup, um, treated, in you know regards to how the the kids who are actually playing each week treated and and honestly other than maybe getting some additional private lesson time with the coach uh for the kids right. that are you know playing high up everybody's expected to put the work in um if 100%. the team is traveling yeah if the team is traveling typically the top six are going to go, obviously, but also maybe seven and eight are going to travel with the right. team, too, just in case there's an injury or an illness. Um, That's correct. And then the kids, you know, if it's a big roster and there's number nine through 12, a lot of times the team is not going to pay for those kids to travel. So they're putting in the work, That's but they're correct. not getting the benefit of the travel and the playtime. And, and again, your child needs to be honest with him or herself about how they're going to feel about that, you know, and right. and making sure they choose a school where either they're pretty assured of being in that top six or they mm-hmm. understand that they're okay with not being there. Exactly. Exactly. Um, great point. Um, you know, when I went through the process, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, I, you know, my question that I always kept coming back to because I was recruited by some of the the really big schools um, that were ranked, you know, in the top 20 in the nation. And my question was, okay, do I want to be a big fish in a little sea or do I want to be a little fish in a big sea? And so I knew that I'm such a competitive person that I had to be in the lineup. I knew if I was going to go there and get my full scholarship and do all that work, that I had to be in the lineup, had to be for something. I had to feel that pressure in the matches. So, um, you know, that made me narrow down my list. I mean, I didn't even take any visits to those top 20 schools because I knew at my level, ranked 70, you know, 70 in the country, I might be fighting to play at number five and six for those top, top schools. So, um, you know, I really looked at, at schools that were ranked between 20 and 70 in the country, and um, that's kind of right where right where NC State fell at the time. I think we were ranked around 41 in the nation, um, and I knew that, you know, I knew that I would play in the lineup. You know, the coach had, was very upfront and told me that I was her top recruit, and, um, you know, I went in and played all four years. I mean, I played between two and four all four years in singles and, and one and two doubles. So, um, for me, I knew that playing time was huge. And so it's definitely important that, um, you know, at the recruiting service, it's very important for me that I talk to the, talk to the athlete and find out, you know, are you going to be okay with doing all this work and then not getting into a match? Because you don't want to have, you, you, 
that's that's our main thing. We don't want to see see people transfer, and we don't want to see them unhappy when they get there. Like our job is to make sure we find the right fit for them. So. Well, and and you know that kind of opens the door to my next point, which is just like these early commitments are non-binding. There's yes. nothing that a coach will tell you <laughs> during the recruiting <laughs> process that's binding. I mean, right. and that's you true. have to you have to get a feel for the integrity of the coach and right. make, you know, make a personal decision of am I buying what they're selling? And Exactly. You know, I've heard so many stories of kids being recruited by a coach, being assured they're going to play in the top three, and never seeing playing time. Because, let's be honest, the coach's job, if they are doing it properly, and Ross taught me this during our process, is the coach is constantly trying to recruit above their existing players. So, Absolutely. you know, if if you're not playing freshman year, the likelihood of you playing beyond freshman year, is pretty low if the coach is doing his or her job well. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Um, You know, and so, you know, it becomes somewhat of a sticky situation, um, you know, when coaches tell you that you're going to be in the lineup. For me, she didn't tell me, my coach at that time, did not tell me I would play in the lineup. She told me I was her top recruit. Well, Mm -hmm. I knew as a top recruit, that's going to put me in the lineup. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, and then as far as, you know, coaches saying those things to you, um, you know, it's tough because, for one, I, as a coach, I never said those things because I don't know if you're going to play in my lineup until you get there that fall semester and I see everyone out on the courts together because things can change over a summer. People can really peak and people can really improve. You know, a girl that played six for me or a guy that played five for me, they could have an unbelievable summer and work extremely hard, and then here they are coming in beating everybody. Their level of play has improved a ton, and now they're at, you know, one and two for me. So Mm -hmm. I can't be telling recruits you know, that, you know, you're definitely going to play in the lineup when I don't know, you know, my six and seven players last year, maybe they improved a lot over the summer. So, you know, it's just like you said, finding the integrity of the coach. I don't think it's fair for coaches, you know, to to guarantee playing spots um, because, you know, like I said, you don't know what's going to happen when, when you get back to school. So, and that's another thing. I mean, PSAs need to know, even though you played in the fall, you don't know what's going to happen in the spring, you know. Uh, people peak at different times. So sure, that's how sure. I stand on. That. Yes. Yeah, and I it's a it, that's an important point to to keep in mind. Cause, and it's not that the coaches are out there, you know, purposely trying to deceive these kids or the parents. You know, it right. just may be their current situation that they're describing, and things change, like you said. So right. just you right. know. The more research that you, the parent, does and the more research that your child does and and the more you talk to current players, past players, current parents, past parents, uh, the better informed you are when you are ready to make that final decision. And, and, you know, it's a tough decision. I will tell you it is a really tough decision. <laughs> And, is, uh, you know, the the more honest you are and the more questions you ask, the better. All right, let's 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 go back to some of the kind of nitty-gritty of, of the process. Um, okay. Let's, let's talk about recruiting videos a little bit because this is something that gets talked about quite a bit. Um, how important are recruiting videos? And, and I'm going to just share our experience with that, which was – my son had a couple of matches that he really loved and that we happened to have a video camera on the fence and, and had the footage from. And so we went through, the two of us, and put together five minutes of footage that he uploaded to uh, YouTube and then sent the link to the coaches that he was interested in and asked them to please take a look and 
that was what he did for a recruiting video. There was nothing. We didn't spend a lot of money. Uh, we didn't hire a service to produce anything. And, mm-hmm. um, Chaz, maybe you can speak to, you know, your experience coaching, your husband's experience coaching, but also what you're hearing from the other coaches out there. What I'm hearing from coaches is, They don't care about a fancy produced video. They don't want to be distracted by music. They don't want to be distracted by all these flashy special effects. Basically, they just want to see how the kid manages himself or herself on the court, how they hit the ball, and, you know, they want to see points that the kids lost because they want to see how the kid behaves after losing a point as well as how they behave after winning a point. Right, for sure. Um, you know, that is a question that is asked, you know, to me all the time. Um, as far as when I was a coach, I will tell you, I watched most of the time those videos on mute. So like you were saying with a fancy production, um, yeah, that is definitely not necessary at all. Um, you know, the main thing as a coach, we just want to see a couple ground strokes, um, you know, some cross courts and down the lines, some approaches, some volleys, some overheads, a couple minutes maximum, um, some serves to the deuce and the add, and then maybe two, two or three minutes of live ball points. Um, because we know as coaches that these videos can be, um, I mean, you can really make, a, an average player look really good in a video um, based on the type of feed that you're feeding them and definitely the opponent you put on the other side. So, I mean, if you put someone over there that is just a um, recreational player on your high school team and you're absolutely crushing them every single point, I mean, coaches know what's going on. So, um, you know, the main thing for us is we are, are – Definitely, the 10 and the 12 minute long videos. I promise you, no one's sitting there taking the time watching this entire video. We are kind of just skimming through it, just just looking at a few key factors. The video is a is is, is one um, factor that coaches use, but a lot of factors are used into you know deciding whether or not we're going to interview your child. So. Therefore, you know, you definitely don't have to spend a lot of money, um, you know, and, and have a big production, although, that's, although some some players do. Um, you know, but like I said, it's um, it's just something, you know, that we, we look at and, and just kind of get a feel for the player. Um, for me, and definitely, you know, I tried to always go watch the, the players that I was recruiting, the ones that made it on my final list. Um, just because I wanted to see live live play. You know, I wanted to see them in a match situation. I wanted to see how they behave, you know, before the match, if they're out, you know, walking around, not, you know, really preparing, uh, you know, or and then how they behave during the match, if they, you know, have a temper and, you know, really how they compete. That was my main thing. Um, so, um, so, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, I think that, you know, I would recommend a video, but I wouldn't say it's the it's not going to be a determining factor whether or not your child gets a gets a scholarship. So, and and I want to just interject that my son the the two schools that it came down to for him, neither of those coaches saw him play live. They made their decisions solely based on the five-minute video he sent, and then some follow-up video that he sent, and and more based on his official visits to the school and the, the actual interaction that he had with the coach and with the team. And, you know, that was what helped those coaches, I think, make the decision right. to offer him a spot. And exactly. so it wasn't, it you know, it's, it's a lot about – the tennis for sure because the the coach's main job is to win period um Absolutely. they want kids that are going to help them win but they also are looking for kids that fit in with the culture of their team and their school and 100% so I completely yeah so agree i think with that's that. really you important know, 
Yeah, it is. It is. And, you know, like I was saying, you know, it is the video is somewhat important because it is a factor where coaches will, you know, look at it. Um, but they also, you know, right off the bat, they're going to they're gonna do their research. As soon as you, they receive the first email from you, they're going to look at your ranking. They're going to look at your sectional ranking, your national ranking, um, your UTR. Then they're going to go pop you into tennis recruiting. They're going to check out your stars. They're going to check out your, your wins and losses. Um, you know, if you've beaten any five stars, if you've beaten any blue chips, um, you know, then they're going to look at your ACT scores, your SAT to see if you can even get into their school and, you know, they're going to look at your video. So there's a lot of factors. And then, like you said, once you go and you start that communication and you go on the visit, 100%, it's your personality and how you interview and if you're going to be able to fit in and how you get along with the current players. Because every single time I had an unofficial or an unofficial, immediately at the beginning of the next practice, I said, go around. Every single person, tell me what you thought. And every single person on the team had to tell me what they thought of that, of that recruit. So, you know, we're going to know what goes on on your visit. The, you know, mm-hmm. if you have, a, if you have a, a coach that has a good relationship with his players on the team, which hopefully, you, you know, that, that you'll find the right fit there, then they're going to be honest with their coach and they're going to tell them exactly what they thought. And so, you know, that comes into the whole thing of the interviewing process at, at SFA of, how we really help the the client and, and, you know, help them with the questions that they're supposed to be asking and, you know, how to network when they're there. So, um, you know, so, yes, I think that, uh, you know, the video is a factor, but it's not going to be the, you know, the final factor. One one question that came up was the question of playing up in the 18s before you're actually – you know, you have to play in the 18. So let's say you're 16 still um, or 15 uh, as a sophomore. How important is it to play up in the 18s? And, you know, all I can can talk about is, is our personal experience. Again, when I've been at tournaments with college coaches there, they're watching the 16s. They're even watching the 12s and the 14s. I mean, these coaches are planning years in advance. They've got these, you know, quote, watch lists of players Mm -hmm. that they're following from a young age. So I, to me, deciding to play up in the 18s just because you think that's where the coaches are going to see you if you're not right. really ready to be playing 18s, in my opinion, you're doing your child a disservice. And I, Chaz, you can speak better to that than than I can. But sure. you know, sure. my son has a summer birthday, so he kind of had to play up into the 18s early just because of having a July birthday and the way our sectional tournaments are structured. Um, but it wasn't to get looked at by coaches. It was more to create opportunities to get into higher level events. For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, the coaches, we, I keep saying we, <laughs> uh, the coaches will um, will watch the 16s, especially at the, at the Nationals, um, like at Easter Bowl, at the big tournaments, at, obviously at Kalamazoo, at, you know, the hard courts a couple, you know, a week ago was, you know, the girls 16s and 18s are together. So the coaches will be there. They will watch some of the 16s, the ones that have started that communication um, with with the with the maybe you know they might have hired a recruiting service and have already by their sophomore year have already started that communication. So they're kind of on their list and and watching them some. Um, my advice is if you have the ability to play up in the 18s, you should play up in the 18s, um, and you can you can pretty much figure that out on your own by just playing a few local events in the 18s, um, you know, USTA ranked events in your area, in your section, and see how you do. And then if you're winning those, great. Then move up to the next, the higher level tournament, okay? Then go again. And then if you're, if you're winning at a pretty high level, then, yeah, you should, you should go ahead and play up. Um, but, you know, if, if you can't compete at that level and you're getting beat, then I don't think it's really necessary. I think you can go ahead and, and max out your ranking in 16 and then start, you know, when you're when you're 16 turning 17, go ahead and start your 18s ranking for sure. I think it okay. it's really dependent on whether or not you can compete. Right. 
right. All right, let's let's talk about making contact with players on the team and for the parents making contact with the parents of the players on the team. It I in for my kid again, um, you know, just speaking from our personal experience, he his sophomore year, he started really kind of asking more detailed questions of the guys he knew that were a couple years ahead of him that were either in the recruiting process or had just completed the process and were already in college. And he really sought advice from them um, about how to contact coaches. You know, what what do I say in my first email? You know, how how do I address them? What do I do after I send the email? What if they don't call me back? Then what do I do? And, right. you know, right. um, and and even though we had the advantage of working with SFA, I do feel like having that connection with older players was mm-hmm. as valuable, if not more valuable in, in some circumstances, um, because mm-hmm. these are – the kids doing what he's looking to do. And so it really helped him. Now, in terms of contacting parents, I mean, if you're going to tournaments, you're meeting parents. And I think, you know, having those conversations is really helpful too. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's my son's going into a unique situation in that Santa Clara has six freshman recruits coming in this year and only one returning player from last year and the returning player is not American and the entire team last season was non-American so Hmm. I I as the parent didn't have access to the parents of those players last year to talk to them but right. my son certainly had access to the to the players and and spent quite a bit of time interacting with them, which mm-hmm. was great. Um, he got a lot of really good information that way. So you know, again, our situation was was different than I suspect most people will face, just because it's mm-hmm. almost a whole new team, a whole new culture coming in this fall and. So, you know, I'm not I'm not the right person to really advise on that other than I I feel like my son's contact with his older tennis friends who were already in college was just hugely valuable. It is. It is. I think that uh um that is something at you know, SSA, you mentioned about, um, you know, helping you with the emails and what you should be saying in the emails and when you should follow up and, and what to do if they don't call you and, and so forth. So, you know, that's something that's, you know, that we're, um, you know, with our consulting company that we w- really help with the student athlete. Um, but you said he really reached out to, to older players that had kind of gone through the process we totally recommend that at SFA because what they can give you is, you know, basically their advice on what happened with them in the recruiting process because everyone's process is different. Um, So, you know, it's nice to get the knowledge from all the different aspects. Um, So as you're going out there and you're playing in the, in the 14s and the 16s, you know, then you, you meet all these players, then, you know, you get their cell numbers and you, you follow them on Instagram and, um, you know, and so you build those relationships and then once they, they're going through that process, then, you know, you have them to network with. Um, I think one of the things that, that's really valuable that someone, um, you know, that a current college player can help you with or help a prospective student athlete with is they can help you with the team dynamics because when you're going through the recruiting process, um, you know, you're looking at the college, you're looking at the conference, you're, you're looking at, you know, whether or not you'll get playing time and, you know, the personality of the coach and, you know, all of these variables. Well, if you get to talk to a former player at that university that has played for that coach, um, you know, then they can really go into more detail and and really give you a, um, you know, a different perspective. So, um, so it's definitely, it's definitely valuable. 
um, that as you're going through these these junior tournaments, that you um, you know that you stay in touch with you know with the people that you're playing and as the the parents are are, are talking and um, you know it's it's uh, it's uh, it's definitely something that will help you in the recruiting process. One thing that you mentioned to me, Chaz, when you and I first spoke on the phone a couple weeks ago was not only asking players about their school, but also talking to them about the schools they play in their schedule. And I thought that was a great point that, you know, you can talk to players at school A and they can give you insight on the coaching style at school B because they've been on court with that coach coaching against them and it can really give you a feel. Absolutely. So you you don't just have to talk to current players on the team, but you can also talk to players who play against that team to get some great insights. To get great insight. That's true. Um, You know, and, uh, and I don't know if a lot of people realize that they thought, you know, Hey, I want to go to the university of, um, you know, Missouri. So they felt like, Oh, I can only talk to players that are at, you know, that are at Missouri you know, no, you can talk to some players that played, you know, at other SEC schools, you know, for instance, you know, Kentucky or Vanderbilt, because they were on the court playing against those players. They saw that the dynamics of the coach and the assistant coach and how it kind of went around. Plus, a lot of them are friends. You may, you know, there there may be a good friend at the University of Missouri that, that plays at the University of Vanderbilt. And so they talk. They know what's going on in the team situations. A lot of time they know – a lot of time the players would know about an injury before I would. So I would be coaching at Stetson, and, you know, we would get, be getting ready for our match, say, against, uh, you know, I, I, mean, I throw a team out there, Kennesaw State, okay? And I would mm-hmm. be sitting there, and, you know, we're warming up before practice and everything, and I said, okay, guys, you know, we got our match with Kennesaw State this week, and then all of a sudden the guys are like, yeah, you know the, the the three guys out this week, and I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, they're not. They're, they're three guys out. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, he's he's out with a shoulder injury. And I'm like, guys, don't you think that's important information for me to have? Like, <laughs> you should have told me that. And they're like, well, this is great for us. Everybody has to move up a spot, you know. So they all talk. They know what's going on a lot of times before I do. So. Um, so yeah, I mean it's like like I said, you know, it's it's great to reach out to the to the current players and and a lot of times they know they know a lot about the team dynamics of um other teams in the conference. Right, right. Um okay, let's let's jump a little bit back to um making your list of schools. And one of the things that TennisRecruiting.net offers is a way for players to to go into their own personal profile and add a list of schools that they're interested in, and they can indicate you know high, medium, or low interest. Um, several months ago, Ross posted something on Facebook that caught my eye, which was you know why he he like I guess cut and pasted a kid's uh, list of schools. And one of the schools on there was USC, and the kid had put medium interest. And Ross was like, you mean to tell me (laughs) that if, you know, this school that has won X number of national championships reached out to you that you're only moderately (laughs) interested in them? Come on. Right. So, Right. What what is the recommendation now about listing schools on TRN? And I think you can the maximum number you can list is ten. Um, right. Do y'all recommend listing them? Do you recommend you know putting high, medium, low interest? Do you or do you recommend just right. leaving that section blank? No, I would definitely recommend listing your ten schools. Um, I think it's a way that um, you know when the coaches go on and they start doing a little bit of research on you, then they see that they're on that list, and you want to put high for all of them. Okay, let's be let's be honest. You when you're going through this recruiting process, um, you know, my goal is to tell the prospective student athlete, let's keep an open mind. Okay, let's have a, a large initial list and let's, um, you know, have a, you, you really want 
to picture yourself in all of these universities. So it's all, you know, your level of interest is a high level at every single one of those. And then once the process, you know, goes further and you start networking and you start the relationship with the coach, then maybe that school might become lower down and eventually you might have to exit off your list. But at the beginning, when you're first putting that that school list out there on, on tennis recruiting, definitely yeah, you need to have high on that for sure. Okay. And and I'll tell you, you know, my son's list evolved over the years. Um, like I said, you know, his initial list were were, you know, these big top uh division one schools and uh he first of all realized he didn't want to stay in the southeast, so a lot of the schools on his first list were southeastern schools and so those came off and right. then he, you know, started to realize that he really liked the smaller university environment, and so the big, huge state schools started coming off his list. And you right. know, so there's nothing that that says that you know once you put a school up there, you have to keep it up there. No, um, as Absolutely. you start to go on these unofficial visits and get a feel for the type of environment you're looking for, then your list changes along with that, and. I did an article a while back about what the coaches get to see on tennis recruiting. So those of you listening, I recommend that you go back and, and find that article on parentingaces.com because the coaches really do get a ton of information uh, about the recruits. And once a recruit indicates a specific school on their list, the coach is notified of that. And so, right. you yeah. know, we get an alert. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And so that's, you know, it's helpful to know what the coach is actually looking at and what they're getting to see. But uh, yeah, I just, I thought it was really funny, Ross's whole thing about mm-hmm. USC. It's yeah. like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that no, is Peter funny. Smith's calling, but yeah, Peter, I'm just, yeah, I'm just, no. Sort of interested. I'll get back to you. Let me get back to you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It was funny. Um, so let's let's also talk about kind of the development of the relationship between a student athlete or PSA and a and a coach. Yes. It's it starts that initial contact is typically an email. Um and and let me just say that the whole allowance for text messaging that came in after my son started the process. So mm-hmm. um, I'm gonna, Chaz, I'm going to let you talk a little bit more about what that rule is in terms of texting. But yes. um, so so the, the PSA initiates contact through email in most yes. situations. Now, understand, I'm not talking about the kid that's number 10 in the country. That kid is right. not going through this process the way the rest of us are. So um, if you have a child that's top 10 in the country, you can just disconnect right now because your experience is going to be completely (laughs) different. But I'm talking about the kid who who doesn't have the coaches knocking down their door that is, you know, looking looking at schools. So they contact, and likely in most cases you're not going to hear back from the coach um, because the coach is getting inundated with email. And so you're going to have to send a second email. And a lot of times I know what my son did in that second email was say, you know, I know you're really busy. Can we set a time to talk on the phone? Would this day or this day work better for you? And that was kind of the second contact. And then they would have the phone contact if the coach was interested or the coach would again, ignore the email, or would respond saying, you're not on my list at this time, but, you know, right. good luck. <laughs> um, right, and then, right. And then, and then at that point, I mean, and this is where things get tricky. At, at that point, the PSA has to make a decision. Am I going to continue reaching out to this coach who has flat out told me I'm not on their list, or am I going to cross them off my list, too, and move on? And I think that's right. a really kind of case-by-case situation. What what it are is. you seeing with that, and what do you all advise? Um, you know, that, um, you know, it really, honestly, for me, I feel like that's where SMFA can, can kind of help because, um, you know, sometimes it's important for 
us as um, you know as a as a consulting company to really advise the the client on what their actual level is. And so, you know, that's probably what happened with Ross, with your son, you know, when he first made that list saying, okay, come back again, you know. Um, and, I, you know, I've had that before where I had a client a few weeks ago sent me her list and I said, you know, and so I gave her a call and I said, listen, I said, you know, this team you have on your list is, you know, four in the nation. I mean, you know, you, you're not at that level, so you need to, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. Even as a walk-on position, it's not happening for you. So let's just go ahead and take that one off the list. So, um, you know, and so sometimes, you know, the the prospective, the client doesn't even doesn't even know really their market value, and and where where they should be sending out these emails to. Um, and so that's something, you know, at, at SFA that I feel like we can, we can help the, the clients with and, and find the right fit for them. But, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times you may not get responses for that first email um, because, number one, we're su- – as I keep saying we because I used to be a college coach, but a college coach is so busy in the fall, in the spring for about, you know, three or four months when we're playing – you know, not only mm-hmm. are we, um, you know, getting kids registered and into the dorms, but, you know, we're planning practices, we're planning unofficial visits, we're planning uh, official visits, flying kids in. Uh, we're also communicating with, you know, the international recruits that we're, we're talking to. I mean, we are juggling a lot of stuff on a daily basis. And not only that, we're getting, you know, 200 emails with with resumes and and I mean for for us to sit there at night and reply to 200 emails we wouldn't have a family life so um you know and during the day we're so busy doing all of those other things so you know the key is I would tell um you know the listeners out there don't be offended if you don't get a reply because it, it's almost impossible for the coaches to it is impossible I'm telling you right now it's impossible for us to reply to all those emails that we received and I was at a middle major school I was at a small well I mean Stetson is definitely a division one it's a middle major school we were division one for 37 years or something it's a great school but there's just not enough time in the day to respond to every single you know PSA there's just not right so, um, but, you know, eventually, you know, after an email or two, like you said, that's a great follow-up email with this day or time work, you know, definitely, you know, we'll, we, they will get back to you. It just may take a couple emails until you, until you get that response. And just don't be offended because it happens to almost everyone. So the key is, is you know, just to keep networking and keep getting the, uh, you know, and also I would recommend also not only sending that email, but then calling in the office because I always check my, you know, coaches always check their, their voicemails in the office. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's good advice. Let's, let's talk about scholarship for a minute because there's a lot of misunderstanding about how the scholarship works and, um, you know, it's different at Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. It's different on the men's side versus the women's side. And there's athletic scholarship money. There's also academic scholarship money to consider grants and loans. Uh, so there, there are lots of ways to pay for a college education these days. Can you uh-huh. talk a little bit about the process of athletic scholarship, um, you know, what's available at each division, and then, you know, how, once an offer is made, how things progress from there. Sure, sure. Um, so basically, Division One and Division Two, they will offer athletic scholarships. Um, division Three, there's no athletic scholarships. It is strictly um, academic scholarships and, and some financial aid. Um, and the same with the, the Ivies, right? The Ivies are yes, no the Ivies, athletic. The Ivies, the Ivies are no athletic, but uh, but they give academic scholarships. So that's the way. That's how they get those blue chips and those five stars on their team. Is I mean, it's not like they're coming there and paying to play there. I mean, they're getting mm-hmm. academic scholarship. So mm-hmm. 
you know, the junior colleges, they have one- to two-year scholarships available. Um, I think that they're good. They're a good option when you need to uh, kind of raise your athletic ability or, you know, you practice for a year, you know, you get better at that junior college, and then maybe you can transfer into a D1 school or if you need to raise your grades. If your grades aren't good mm-hmm. enough to get into a D1 school, sometimes you might want to look at a, at a junior college for a couple years, but they have scholarship as well. Same thing with the NAIA. Um, they have scholarship. Um, they The NAIA tends to have a lot less stringent rules than, than the NCAA. Uh, we had touched on a little bit about the rules. Um, you know, like you had mentioned, you know, you have to have a certain GPA. Um, you know, so... Um, a lot of times NAIA is affiliated with a with a certain religious group. Um, a lot of times Division Three, um, they really they really have uh, really good academics. So um, you know, there, there's just a bunch of a, a bunch of different factors when it comes into financial aid and, and scholarships. Um, you know, some universities are fully funded, and so that means that they have the full amount of scholarships available, um, and some universities are not. Some of the, the smaller universities are not fully funded, so they don't have, like, for instance, you know, women's tennis is allowed to have eight scholarships. Sometimes universities don't have that, and I don't know if a lot of listeners are aware of that. Um, sometimes the smaller schools are not awarded that because it's not in the budget, it's not in the money. So, it's, um, and and it's, let me interrupt you one second. When when you say that on the women's side there are eight scholarships, and and for the record on the men's side there are four and a half. So just mm-hmm. understand the difference there. Um, what does that scholarship cover? Does it cover only tuition? Does it cover tuition, room and board, tuition, room and board, and books? Um, how is that determined, and does it vary school to school? Um. So a full athletic scholarship um, is considered free tuition, full room and board. Uh, basically, everything would be paid for, your books, everything. Um, now, that doesn't mean that a coach doesn't have the ability to um, to offer you something less. Um, you know, you are allowed to break up the scholarships. And so you could have, um, you know, one girl on 50% and then another girl on 50%, and then that took your your one full scholarship. So, you know, different universities do it different ways and different coaches do it different ways. Um, so a lot of times, you know, I think it's um, – it's, um, I don't think it's necessarily um, – I don't know how to word it, but, um, you know, a lot of times, like, for instance, when when I was coaching at Stetson, I may have a girl that was on uh, a 20% academic scholarship. So, therefore, I didn't need to have her on 100% athletic um, because I would have her, you know, 20% of her scholarship covered from academics. So, you know, so then that leaves me with another 20% somewhere else. And then also... (laughs) Everything that, that that comes into consideration with that as well is in state and out of state tuition, um, mm-hmm. because a lot of times what you're given as a coach for your budget with the, with those scholarships is um, sometimes you're given a an actual amount, and so you can you know you divide that up whether the the player is from out of state or whether the player is from in state, and so the cost is different. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of variables to it. Um, and most of the and time, I can't imagine that coaches go into detail about that with with the, with the clients, you know, with the right. prospective student athletes. You know, it's not, I don't know if it's really even any of their business to know kind of how you decide to budget and, and, and make up all those scholarships. Really, what you should be concerned is, is if there is money available. Like that is something mm-hmm. at, you know, SFA that we will – um, you know, advise you to ask when you go on your on your visit is, you know, or even before you go on your visit, you know, even if it's just in a phone conversation, you know, once you build the relationship, um, how many spots are there for my class? Say, say, for instance, you know, my son is a 2017, then he would start the communication and he would say, you know, how many, how many, how many players are you recruiting for the 2017 class? And then is there scholarship money available for that? 
And then simply the coach will say either yes or no. Sometimes there's no mm-hmm. money available. Sometimes there is. So, And that changes year to year. And Absolutely. typically the scholarships are, the agreement is for one year. But there are cases where coaches and athletic directors are willing to sign a contract for more than one year. And that's a conversation that your your player needs to have with the coach. And then, you know, I kind of feel like um, in, in our situation, the tennis stuff is my son's area, but the financial part of it is our area. And so I have had that conversation with his coach that, you know, here's our situation. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I just want to be up front with you and, you know, I – Anything tennis related, my son will come to you. Any academic, anything, once he gets there, that's his purview. But since we're the ones writing the check, you know, I want right. to have that, the money conversation with you. And and the coach right. was more than happy to have that conversation with me. And, Absolutely. you know, but situations change. Um, students transfer. Uh, students right. graduate. It frees money up. Um, right. There may be a student who was on partial scholarship and the family's financial situation changed and so the coach yeah. was able to find additional money to keep that child at the school but right. there under no circumstance is a coach under obligation to do that and I think that's right. important for for listeners to understand Absolutely absolutely I think that's a that's a super important you know and um you know the main thing is that you you build that good relationship with that coach and that, um, you know, that you're doing your homework and you know that you're, you know, that you're going to a school where, um, you know, like you feel like, okay, I've had a lot of honest communication with, with my coach and I know that, okay, this is a one-year contract and um, and things can change at the end of the year. Maybe I won't be on money next year. Maybe I will be on money next year. Maybe I'll be on more money. Um, so that's something that... Um, yeah, most scholarships are one year, but that sometimes they are offered. The NCAA has now allowed that where they can go, you know, they can go ahead and offer you four years. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and then in terms of when the money, you know, when that decision is made, typically with the athletic money, it's that decision's made at the time of the offer. The academic money, likely you're not going to hear until late in the spring of your child's senior year of high school, whether or not they've been awarded academic money from the school. So, you know, parents, you need to plan ahead. Um, I can tell you we just had to make our first payment at Santa Clara. And, um, you know, it's my son starts classes September 21st. They're on the quarter system. So it's a little later than maybe a lot of the schools that are on semesters would be, but you have to plan ahead for this stuff and, you know, make sure that you have that conversation and your child has that conversation and understands how the coach awards scholarship money because every coach, like Chaz said, every coach does it differently. Some do it based on performance. Some do it based on where you play in the lineup. Some do it based on how hard the kid's working or things mm-hmm. off the court that the that the kid does that enhance the team. Right. I mean, so every coach has different factors that they use and and everybody needs to be kind of upfront with what the expectations are and have an understanding of that. It's, you know, college is expensive. I mean, even if your Absolutely. child's on a full ride, I'll tell you my middle child who's not an athlete went to University of Georgia, which is our state school. She had a full academic scholarship but it still cost us about 10 grand a year to send her there between right. you know books lab fees housing um mm-hmm. you know gas for a car i mean there are expenses and mm-hmm. it's important that you you understand that and and another question that that i'm i'm so shocked nobody asked me um but i'm going to bring up is once the child is offered a spot on the team whether or not that mm-hmm. comes with scholarship money then mm-hmm. what? what's next? Is the child automatically enrolled in the university? And and the answer is no. <laughs> um, right. Right. Uh, again, I I will say that this differs school to school. Um, mm-hmm. My son, once he was 
made the offer. Um, the coach said, I need you to get the online application filled out within the next two weeks um, mm -hmm. because I'm going to personally walk it through the admissions process. And right. it was a very easy process for my son, but he still had to be accepted by the university. It's not That's always an automatic that your child gets in the school, though That's I correct. do think it's rare for in tennis programs where if the coach has made the offer that, that the kid's not getting in, right? I mean, do you hear that right. ever? Um, you do hear of that, but a lot of time it happens with uh, with the international kids because right. they, uh, yeah, going through the process for them, it's just getting all the transfers, the credits and everything um, through the admissions department. So sometimes it's uh, it's a little bit more of a strenuous process for, for coaches. But, um, you know, once you start that first um you know, communication, um, obviously, you know, as a, as a former coach, you know, like I said, I would look at your ranking, I would look at your tennis recruiting, your UTR, and then, of course, I'm going to ask you for your ACT and your SAT scores. Uh, and eventually, I kind of, you know, I, I know what it, what it takes to get into to, to the school, so that kind of gives me somewhat of a factor, but, you know, even before you come on your, your visit, um, you know, usually I would ask for your transcripts. And so I would send the test scores and the transcripts over to admissions and say, hey, this is a PSA I'm interested in. Uh, can you let me know, uh, yeah, you're nay, are they going to be a qualifier or a non-qualifier? And so you kind of get the – if the coach is doing their homework and they're, you know, in communication with the academic department, which, you know, I'm pretty sure 100 percent of the – 90 percent of the time I, I would say they are – that they're doing that, then you know you should you should probably be accepted. So um, mm -hmm. you know, and if it's if you're not, then of course I would go. You know, I would then go back to the client and and say or the prospective student athlete and say, hey, you know, look, these you know your your test scores are not high enough, um, you know, to get in our university. So you need to retake the test and and let me know what your new score is. You know, something. To and that said, so. taking taking the ACT and the SAT no later than spring of your junior year is a great idea <laughs> because um, you have to, yeah you have to have one of those scores on file in order to take an official visit your senior year you are not allowed by the NCAA to take an official visit without an ACT or, or an SAT one or the other not both um yeah. on yeah. file so um I you know when my son was taking unofficial visits to the schools he was absolutely asked you know what are your test scores what's your GPA right. up front that right. was one of the first questions the coaches asked because right. that determines whether or not there's even any reason to continue the conversation. Um, if the kid cannot get into the school academically, then the coach doesn't need to waste their time, and the, the kid doesn't need to waste the time. So, exactly. Absolutely. you know, it was really helpful for my son to have that score um, to to – submit to the coaches as he was communicating with them so that right. they knew whether it, he was worth their time. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, at SSA, we recommend that you start studying for that SAT or ACT, you know, your sophomore year, and that, you know, hopefully by the fall that you're taking that ACT, SAT or ACT for the first time of your junior year, and then you can take it again for the second time in the winter, <laughs> and then if you need to, you can take it again in the spring. You know, you can take it as many times as, as, as you want, um, you know, to improve your score. And then the the universities, they won't see all of those scores. They will see, you know, the best score that you send in. So, um, so you know, I think that it's, um, you know, I know that, that some um, – some prospective student athletes are not, um, you know, educated well enough about that, and so they wait until, you know, the end of their junior year to take it, and then they're super stressed that they don't have a high score. So, right. you know, the earlier you start studying for it, um, you know, and possibly, you know, you you take it the first time and it's not what you wanted, then you can then go get help and maybe get a tutor or, um, you know, find a prep class that can help you, you know, to kind of raise your score in the area that you were, that you scored low in. 
And and in our case, my son took the prep class fall of junior year. He took the SAT in January of his junior year, and right. his score was, you know, great and you know, perfectly fine uh, to get him right. where he was looking. So, um, but but it was a big relief to to be able to give that score to the coaches and have them say, "Oh, right. you'll be fine. No worries." Right. Um, you know, and 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 he was well. I don't know that he was. I was fully prepared for the fact that he might need to take it more than once. Um, my daughters right. both took it multiple times, but his right. score was such that he didn't need to. So that was a big relief. You know. From that side of yeah, things, yeah, that's right. So that was good. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, I'm I'm going to ask you one last question, then I'm going to let you go back to work because I I've kept you way longer than I told you I would. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no problem. Um, let's let's talk about what happens when you get an offer from a school, but it's not your top choice, and you're still waiting to hear from your top choice. How do you handle that? And okay. Um, Go ahead. No, Sorry, I, I was going to say, you <laughs> tell, no, I was going to say, you, you tell us, like, what, how do you recommend that these kids handle the communication with the coach once a coach has made them an offer? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, getting an offer is um, something you should be very proud of because, I mean, you want to think about all the junior tennis players that are out there. Um, you know, it's a very, very large scale. So to get an offer is, um, you know, it's something that you should, you should not take lightly and you should be very proud of it. And you need to be sincere with that coach and tell them, even if it's not the offer that you wanted, even if it is a very small offer, you should be thankful for it. And you need to let that coach know, you know, that you really appreciate the offer and, and then taking the time to, um, you know, really, um, you know, interview you basically. Because at the same time when the when the, the, the perspective of the PSA is interviewing these schools, you know, you've got to realize that these coaches are interviewing you at the same time. I mean, just like you have your list, the coach has a list that's, you know, three times longer than your list. So the fact that you would even, you know, you would get a spot on the team, but then also to get an offer, it, it's, a, it's an accomplishment. So, you know, the main thing I would say is is just to really show the gratitude towards the coach and, and really thank them for, for the offer. And, um, you know, then you just ask for, you know, a week or, you know, I would say a week to go over, you know, and, and for you to, to make the decision. Um, and then you have a week then. And, and the coach may say, okay, I don't have a week. You know, I, I only have three days. Can you give me a decision in three days? And then after three days, then you can go back again and say, you know, this is the biggest decision I've ever made. Um, you know, I don't weigh this decision lightly. I really need some more time, you know. But but in that week when you first get the offer, then you need to go to the schools that are your top choice. And, you know, you call those coaches and you say, listen, I've received an offer from – you know, whatever, from, say, Georgia State. I received an offer from Georgia State. Um, it is not my top school. Your school is my top school. And, you know, Georgia State would like an answer. However, I don't want to shut the door to that school if I'm not going to be able to join your team or have a scholarship on your team, depending on if you're looking for a scholarship at that top choice. Mm-hmm. The main thing, mm-hmm. you want to know if you're going to even be allowed to have a spot on that team. And so once those coaches start to have conversations with you and they realize that you're getting the offers from the other, most of them are going to be really upfront with you and get you an answer, you know. So, um, And that was our experience. I want to share that was exactly our experience, you know. Okay. That once my son got the offers and went back um, to some other schools, and it's not that they were, you know, higher on his list or whatever, but he just wanted to make sure he had all the information before he made his final decision. Um, the other coaches were were very happy to be straight up with him at that point. And, right. Right. you know, we appreciated that. Yes, that's great. So, yeah, I think I think that's great advice. And it's, you know, listen, you're you're talking about 17 and 18-year-old kids dealing with these issues. This is 
adult level stuff that they're handling and it's not easy for them and there are a lot of kids who shy away from these kinds of situations they don't like conflict they you know it's it's an uncomfortable situation and right. i am telling you from a parent's perspective it is one of the greatest lessons your kid will get out of this recruiting <laughs> thing and out of this junior tennis thing is learning how to manage these types of uncomfortable situations with adults. And I was so amazed at my son's poise and his ability to communicate clearly and the respect he showed. And I, I just, you know we as parents don't always get to see that side of our children and right. it's an incredible thing to witness i i got to tell you it is it is it's um you know the whole recruiting process it's uh it's life lessons um you know and that's something we emphasize at FS, at SFA is you know our job is to you know give you insight on the ins and outs of the recruiting process um but you know but to really show you that this whole thing is like a huge interview. And so, you know, how you network and, you know, the connections that you make, um, you know, those are things and how you build relationships and how you interview when you're talking to the coach on the phone and when you're there in person and what questions you ask and how you behave and all of those things are going to help you in the future when you go on job interviews. You know, that's our job at SFA is, is to help you feel comfortable in those situations and prepare you with questions that that you should ask and questions that might be asked to you. So, right. And it's it's a, well, it's a fun process. It is. It is totally fun. Very stressful, I will say, extremely <laughs> stressful. And parents, please please remember that Again, like Chaz said, this is the biggest decision likely your child has ever had to make, and they are feeling the pressure of that. And fall semester senior year for these kids is hugely stressful. They've got a lot on their plate, and adding the stress of, oh, my gosh, am I going to get an offer at the school that I want to play college tennis after working these past 10 years for this opportunity, you know, you need to acknowledge that stress and really help your child understand why they're they may be feeling the way they're feeling, why they may be having trouble sleeping, why they may be coming down with colds more often. I mean, stress does yucky things to our bodies, and um, right. So I think if if we parents can go into the process understanding a little bit about that pressure that our kids are under, uh, that it it really will help things go a little more smoothly. But but don't be shocked when you have days that are just like, oh my God, I am going to kill my kid. Thank God he's going to college next year because <laughs> you're gonna have you're gonna have those days during the process. You just you know it's it's stressful on everybody and. Um, right. Just acknowledge it and deal with it the best you can. And I'm always here as a sounding board. I'm a really good ear. Um, so reach out to me. You guys all know how to get in touch with me now. My contact information's all over parentingaces.com. And Chaz is here now, too, as a resource. Um, and Absolutely. Scholarship for Athletes has phenomenal information available free of charge on their website, some incredible videos and articles um, that you can use and share with your student uh, student athletes. So, Chaz, thank you. I, I can't even, uh, gosh, I just appreciate so much you <laughs> taking time to do this with me today. And welcome to Scholarship for Athletes. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to working with you and helping our readers and listeners stay up to date on what's going on in the recruiting world. Great, great. Thanks, Lisa. I really enjoyed it, and I hope to talk to you real soon. Thanks, Chaz. To my listeners, have have a great great week. Thanks, you too. To my listeners, have a great week. We will be back next week with another fantastic show on Parenting Aces. In the meantime, enjoy yourself, and uh, happy back to school for those of you in that mode. And for, for us, we're just getting ready for college, so it's busy. Have a great week, everybody.